until gold does something fabulous, it'll get a cursory mention because to ignore it forever will look too much like abject intent. So they might do a cursory mention, but then have some opinion guy that says it's a bubble that's going to blow off. Some some kind of nonsense like that. When in actual fact, the bubble is debt and gold is the response. Welcome back to Soar Financially. Thank you so much for joining us here on this channel where we discuss the macro to understand the micro. My name is Kai Hoffman. I'm the at JR Mining guy on Twitter and the CEO of the Soar Financial Group. And I hope everybody had a wonderful Christmas break with the family. For me, it's uh, it's been tough getting back into the slog here and to getting, getting ready for this interview, getting my head focused, spending three days here with the kids solely and uh, enjoying the Christmas break with them was fantastic. But we got to talk. We we got to talk about uh, 2023. We got to recap it a little bit. Uh, I know we've talked a lot about 2023, so we're we're going to keep that part brief. But uh, our guest made some fantastic calls over the last 12 months that we need to recap. And uh, I think it's important to understand the history, although it being the last 12 months, to sort of forecast 2024 a little bit as well. Because uh, he, he is the market sniper. He makes fantastic trade calls. And uh, you can, of course, sign up to his course, themarketsniper.com as well. But uh, let me bring my guest on. It's uh, Francis Hunt. Francis, it's good to see you again. Thanks for making the time during Christmas and uh, New Year's. It's always a busy time with family. I know you're on holidays right now, so I tremendously appreciate your time. Oh, absolute pleasure. And I, and I love talking about what it is we do at all times. So it's it's no skin of my nose to come forward and be on your show. Thanks for inviting me, Kai. Much appreciated. No, I really, really do. And uh, let, let's try to keep this as brief as possible. I don't want to keep you away from, uh, you know, the fun stuff in the world, uh, spending time with family and friends here. But um, let, let's start with recapping 2023. You were on uh, Soar Financially in June, at the end of June, and you made some fantastic calls. You called the Japanese yen. We talked about bond yields, but we also talked about bon uh, monk-like patience for gold and silver investors. And it seems like that's paid off as well. But uh, let, let's start with a more generalist, gen general question there, Francis. What were some of the mega trends? or some of the trends that influenced your trading last year? Wow. Uh, so the, the year that's just passed, was a, it, it felt to me that the rest of the financial world uh, suddenly realized and uh, got the feel, or at least the slight chill through the door that um, we may have had peak bonds in the, uh, 2020 as a result of the events of March 2020. Uh, this was something we said at the time in 2020, um, and most people thought we were a little bit crazy. And it's taken about two or three years for that properly to stick into people's minds. And actually, the Fed and the central banking cartel across the globe, I know you're in the EU zone at the moment um, as well, has started to reiterate higher for longer uh, type messages. And in actual fact, that, that the next big move could, you know, not they may not get as many cuts as you think as economic weakness starts to uh, take hold in many people's eyes, et cetera, et cetera. So the, the, the great debt um, delusion seems to have hit the wall and people have got to where we were in 2020 and 2023. Uh, and many more people are talking about the debt situation, the debt crisis. And a couple of quick fire points and then I'll close on that because this is just an opening statement, but um, people are understanding that money's borrowed into existence. So we borrowed too much money into existence. That has led to asset uh, hyperinflationary bubbles. Um, and then eventually, after the events of Mars 2020, when some of the largest, instead of going into balance sheet items such as home values, equity values, and everything else, actually was put in cash in the layman's hands, we, uh, the inflation narrative uh, took hold. Now, whilst they will tell you that inflation is down, you've got to remember that we've got a rolling year-to-year -year comparison and being only 2.9 or 2.5% above last year, uh, when last year was 11% or 9% more than the year before, it's, it's a bit like saying I'm slowing down when you're still accelerating, just at a slightly slower pace. So those are the big uh, things, uh, devaluation, debt, and what it meant for the banking system. Don't forget, we started this year uh, with a banking crisis. We had the second and third biggest bank failure crisis uh, in the start of this year. It feels a long time ago, but that was around about January. So I would say uh, the, uh, debt. Uh, and the one final point I'll make on the debt uh, to answer the question is that many people, and that many people don't understand this, 
for all this proliferation that has to happen, new debt. So Yellen did very short term when the rates were low, one and two years because it was cheaper to put a roll debt for one or two years instead of 10. Those are all coming back and need rolling again at much higher rates. The, uh, the, the amount in interest payments that is going on is obscenely large. It's dwarfing the military industrial complex spend, which is a massive line item on the, 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 the largest defense budget in the world, but I think for the next 10 nation states is the common uh, comparable. Uh, and the tax take is dropping. So there is a real downdraft in the feel good factor, uh, both on properties, uh, drop valuations dropping, um, people's incomes, job cancellation. So the borrowing is having to get higher. And when you have a greater flow of new debt that has to be issued, old debt that's coming to be rolled, you're actually having too much debt coming into the system. And the point of Valuation is usually about scarcity. How scarce is it? Debt is the least scarce thing in the world. Um, and as a result, valuations normally go down, my elbow, and rates go up. There's that inverse relationship. So I warn and I continue to warn that an interest rate spike is actually more probable in a debt collapse. Remember, everybody thinks the Fed and the central bank set the rates. Eventually, if they, they can, they obviously for a while do, but if the market disagrees, the market talks. And that's why you had the Bank of England change rates twice in a day during the George Soros crisis. Not because they wanted to, not because they changed their mind over lunch, because the market disagreed. So actually, the final setting parameter of rates is a market that is looking at a huge pipe dumping debt. This is the single biggest realization that is starting to hit home in a number of places for 2023. Yeah, absolutely. Lots of great points to follow up on, uh, Francis, there, and uh, we, we will do so. But to one, one, one more general question here is like, how strong is the economy, you know, leaving 2023 or exiting 2023 here? I think it's very well set up for what we've termed a demand destroying event. And I think that's almost quasi intentional. Um, we've, I mentioned in the prelude with you that there's a lot of chatter about UBI. Uh, coming into this year when everybody's, you know, looking at the internet in between Christmas lunch and dinners and Boxing Day and all the good things, there seems to be an immense amount of chatter. And I, I don't tend to think these things are random. And if you're to have a reset crash, you typically want a heightened state of readiness or to have already introduced some form of stipend. And there's talk now that Canada will have a 2000 Canadian dollar a month for every citizen um, issued. That's now nationwide. They've been doing, we know they've been doing these spot tests where they say data has confirmed mentally uh, unwell people or anxious people about their personal finances feel better when they get given free money. Um, those kind of uh, bizarre political statements. So I would also point to the 2024 having an overture of preparedness for the debt collapse. So that's what other people are rising and uh, uh, finally realizing in 23 that we highlighted in 20 and said you should short bonds, go long yields uh, and short the debt and go long gold. Uh, is certainly coming about. We spoke about the last time you and I uh, conversed, I think it was May, um, and gold was at about 1910s. Uh, you're looking at it going almost, it's getting exceedingly buoyant right now, trading at 2083. Um, so even though I said you've got to be patient as a monk, that's still reasonable progress and looking to get really interesting as well. Absolutely. Yeah, no, gold is definitely not an asset that usually moves, uh, you know, $1,000 a day like Bitcoin does, for example. But, uh, you know, the volatility in gold over the last few weeks here has been actually quite astonishing, in my opinion, because uh, we, we rallied over 2110, I think, at one point, dropped down below 2000 again rather quickly. So lo lots of fluctuation there in the gold price. But um, just recapping 2023 a bit more here and uh, diving a bit into the inflation narrative as well. Um, do you agree with Paul Grugman? Did we beat inflation? Uh, is it a temporary phenomenon or uh, did we beat it for good? Absolutely not. And nothing about things like UBI suggests that uh, any lessons are taken on inflation. We, I feel that they know what they're going to do uh, if they were to pursue policies like that. Inflation isn't beaten. Inflation comes in surges. And as I say, if you're comparing our current inflation rate to a high watermark a year ago, 
Of course, it only looks like it's gone up less so. It's a bit like um, you know me comparing your your best sprint at 100 meters uh, today to you know your best sprint when you're a teenager. It's going to be difficult for that to look like it's a high number. Uh, your relative overperformance on that. Um, so we're comparing at the moment on a year-to-year basis to peak inflation. So the notion that you've actually won out. Um, when you were comparing to a localized high because the number is relatively lower. It's absolutely uh, incorrect in my take. And with policies of proliferation, military interventions, expanding um, the possibility that you might get a bit of bid under the energies as a result of that, uh, the, the high amount of funding that has to go to interest serving, which reduces other discretionary spending, which sees more emergencies. This all points to proliferation and further proliferation. The ability to not run a balanced book in terms of what you get as income and what you spend is now finally coming home to roost. And the only thing they can do is to continue to do what they do, have done before, which is proliferation. Only the requirement is ever more parabolic, which takes you into the steep end of the curve, which leads to the eventual failure. Um, so with that, environment, hyper stagflation is in fact our uh, undertaking. You have two economies. You have on the, and, and just to broaden this point out tiny bit, 40% of the stock market is the Magnificent Seven. If you took their performance out of the S&P 500, you've actually got a negative S&P for everybody else. Um, no one's talking like it's a negative S&P, but those are the status mega corporations that get a lot of funding from military industrial complex. You think of Amazon and their servers for all the, the military, government, et cetera, uh, have secret services, CIA, they're all on there. You look at Microsoft competing in that space. You look at the data ha um, uh, harvesting of citizenry. These are the big corporations that are essentially the control structure, the sort of corporate fascism that the government is interworking with in uh, what it wages against us as the citizenry. Uh, the rest of the, the, the second economy, which is the retail consumer and you and I, um, generally the retail person, which I think you and I are relatively fortunate, but the average man in the street is, is struggling and his buying power is being eroded and his grocery bill is going up a lot faster than the official Bureau of Labor stats is saying in America and or Germany. And as a result of them, they're getting a discretion, the income squeezed. They already are two family uh, workers. The mum is already at work. Uh, the child is already being looked after a minder. There's no more fat uh, to uh, to tap into in this. And so what you get is a real squeeze on quality of living. This fact that number goes up on their salary, but so does the taxation, they get dragged into higher bands. So does the cost of living that they're actually getting poorer while number go up. And of course, the number go up is the, the number that is a proliferated fiat number, and everybody's being dragged into higher extraction rates. So you have two economies, you've got the mega corporates that are swimming in um, government contracts. So the biggest employers on the unemployment stats in the US is pharmaceutical industrial complex and government. Well, government employment never used to be counted as productive employment. They don't pay taxation. That company doesn't earn and generate a tax. That activity doesn't, it's in the service provision. They are public sector servants. We used to call them public servants. They were supposed to serve you and I because we paid them from our taxation. Recruitment on higher wages, we're just committing to ever higher fixed cost in our business as we're reducing profitability. If you and I were running this show, it's it's kind of like we're making less profit and we, let's buy another premises or let's hire another premises and open more restaurants. We're not making money. Um, let's expand the formula. That's a terrible idea. Um, so all of those things point to further proliferation, unsound money principles, which will lead to the hyper stagflation. The stagnation is you, the retail consumers, the hyper, which is uh, the extreme aspect on the inflation is the devaluation of the money. And the only ones making out like bandits are the ones that hold huge assets, borrow really cheap and have government contracts. And that is the Magnificent Seven and their ilk. No, absolutely. Um, th the Fed came out surprisingly dovish or quite uh, aggressively dovish, I, I would say. Like I was really, I wouldn't say shocked, but I was quite surprised to hear Powell be so clear about potential rate cuts next year. Uh, three is, is sort of forecast by the Fed. The market expects seven rate cuts now next year as well. Uh, 
what does that tell you? Like it sort of hits hints at the same. You know, there's something happening in the market that the the market is trying to sort of forecast like a, a bigger crash scenario because apparently like. Jerome Powell created enough of a cushion with a five and a quarter or five and a half percent to sort of try to balance that. Is it, does he have enough tools to sort of fight uh, what might come in 2024? Well, who's going to be buying the debt? Because remember, again, here's your thing. Rate go down. That's my hand. Rates go down. Debt valuation go up. That's my elbow. You want a, a fulcrum here. Do you want to buy bonds? Well, they, if they're thinking, if they convince enough people that they're understating how much they'll cut and they'll be forced to do more, that as a flight to safety this time, people will go to bonds. But the gold market's the one that's going up. And the bond market, yep, you've had a bit of a turnaround on yields, but who's buying it all? It's not China. It's not. Uh, it's certainly not the BRIC nations. So it's a, it's an, it's a sort of allies uh, of the Western old world order, Japan and Britain, which are essentially part of the same central banking cartel of the Western axis. Go watch our video on, with Prof Werner on how Japan is essentially dictated to by the Fed, the Bank of Japan, uh, the Federal Reserve following the World War II peace um agreements so you, they co-opted into sustaining and they, they they married they tied to the mast let me use the phrase the same western mast and they now are the alleged buyers why would japan who's buried in debt that has got had yield curve control until recently and has even more debt and lower rates commit to buying other parties debts surely the sound investment is that which is currently being made by russia and china which is in gold. Uh, and central banks have been massive buyers this year. By the way, add that to your first question, the theme of the debt, the, the, the penny dropping on the debt. Purchases by the big players that are not tied to the mast of the Western scheme. Uh, and China and Russia's purchases of gold uh, and many other central banks uh, has been very, very high. Plus repatriations of gold to the likes of the Dutch and other people, all very important. Suddenly, everybody wants to know where their shiny metal pet rock is that uh, Paul Krugman speaks about uh, and wants it preferably in their own backyard rather than somewhere else. And others are quite happy to relieve you of your pet rock and hand you uh, dollar promissory notes, uh, whether they be dollar bills or sell their treasuries for dollars and buy gold. And this is why we're going into the year with it at 2083, looking like it wants 84. And as I'm currently looking, we're on a weekly. If it were to, the clock to stop, we will do our, remember we did our highest monthly close on gold. Uh, the last time we spoke, you said uh, the video had the strap line, patience of a monk required. You're starting to get those rewards for your patients and it's six months since we spoke. The, you're gonna get not only the highest monthly of November's close against the dollar, but you're now looking good for the best weekly close uh, at the moment. And you know we've not got too many days left in this week for it to hang on, and it's looking quite perky indeed. Absolutely. Let's stay on the gold topic for a second here, and uh, let's discuss because uh, it seems like the journalists are not in the market yet. Uh, you mentioned central banks buying. Uh, I don't think the ETFs are seeing any inflows at this point uh, buying buying gold. A two part question: A, who, who's really buying it? Like, and why aren't the journalists at the table? Or what do the journalists need to see? Uh, to jump into the market. We've breached uh, all-time high levels twice now, and uh, I don't even see a tagline or a headline on Bloomberg right now. So the, the, one of the key points to highlight, and it's something I reference absolutely every time, if you want favor and you want to be a journalist that gets led into the meetings to ask questions, the last thing your publication should be doing is highlighting that uh, gold made an all-time high on a monthly close last November. I mean, the, the month just passed. Um, that's not the kind of journalism they like. And they're very good at virtue signaling this and making it quite clear what you're allowed to talk about that they approve of and what you talk about they disapprove of. So gold essentially is the canary in the gold mine uh, about um, unsound money principles. And when people stop believing in debt and fiat and they start moving it, particularly the other nation states that know the game more than the citizens, who typically are the first movers, they know far more than you let on. And of course, big financial CEOs in banks, they start buying uh, gold and the Fed and the, the financial journalistic press are incentivized not to highlight that point. So before this very good question you asked, on at, at the last day of November, I said, 
currently a headline not put in any American circular will be the fact that you've just closed at an all time high on a monthly chart close. Uh, and I expect the same for this week. In short, until gold does something fabulous, it'll get a cursory mention because to ignore it forever will look too much like abject intent. So they might do a cursory mention, but then have some opinion guy that says it's a bubble that's going to blow off. Some, some kind of nonsense like that. When in actual fact, the bubble is debt and gold is the response and is the final holdout point. Um, and th that's uh, invariably, I would anticipate those kind of uh, gaslighting and uh, reframing taking place in due course after gold uh, starts to get into the mid 2000s. Do you see a certain trigger for generalists to jump back in? And uh, as he says, like, it's not the headlines, obviously. So would it need to be a default on the government side? Would it need to be a collapse in the commercial real estate market or something that sort of triggers it, the straw that breaks the camel's back for people to aggressively jump into gold? I think we've already had those things uh, a few times, in fact, but they don't get highlighted and gold isn't put forward as a solution. Unless you're talking to someone like myself or many of the, uh, the others in um, the sound money space. Uh, in short, commercial property is collapsing. There's there's properties with only 15% rentals. If you're not tier one and you're in the outlying secondary cities and you're a tier two or three commercial, especially office space, people aren't going there. People aren't going to work. They're working remotely. People aren't driving. The, one of the big things that came out of the March 2020 events was a much higher tendency to work from home. Um, and secondary, com so commercial property is collapsing. Those mortgages can't be paid before subprime. Uh, my apologies, before uh, March 2020, the last crisis, there were uh, S&P 500 companies that were borrowing to pay dividends. There were 15% of the companies were actually making borrowing. Now they were doing that at the time on relatively low uh, rates because it was a lower cost of capital than equity capital. They, instead of diluting their equity, they take loans. Now, all those loans, what's happened to them? They've gone even higher uh, in terms of their cost. So there's a lot of businesses that are that have, that made very irresponsible on the low forever. And don't forget, we were sold negative interest rates. No, never mind, no, uh, as possibilities. And I never took any of that seriously, even though some people bought a 100,000 Austrian bond a uh, hundred thousand, my apologies, a hundred year Austrian bond uh, at a ridiculously low percentage. Um, and many, there was about, I think, a third of European debt traded at a negative rate. Well, that's all changed real quick. Um, and this is why I say a bucket of cold water has been poured on that. Short bonds, long gold is, is one of the best cross asset uh, collapse trades, in my opinion. And I've looked all the buy bond wear diamonds guys since nine since 2020 uh in august and there were countless of them and many of them still want to play in the traffic of the chop and churn because you're getting a bit of a pullback and i've said the pullbacks will not be as satisfying you the trend has reversed the next thing is collapse you could face a spike and guess what i've seen how those spikes work out one of our big calls were euro swiss franc not once but twice there actually was a peg that the Swiss National Bank committed to and said it is a fulcrum of our policy when they were holding it at 1.2 in 2015. People were buying it every time it came down. The euro Swiss franc at 1.2, thinking they had their back. It could only bounce. And next thing, the, it traded 1.1999. There was no announcement and they just walked. And that thing absolutely collapsed and it went zero bid and traded one. It fell about 20% in the space of literally a day and a couple of sessions more. And you got filled, if you were one of the guys buying at 120, you got filled at some account decimating level, even if you had a stop loss. Uh, and then later, some brokers even restated that fill even lower on the basis that their liquidity providers, ergo the key big banks, Goldman Sachs, Merrill uh, Lynx, Bantamon, never actually gave them their fills. And as a result, they were going to restate them to you. So uh, that is my prediction for what could happen to those that want to play the bonds long uh, on the pullback of the rates. It's a dull, bad, dirty market. Stay out of it. Shorted only. Um, in my opinion, if you know how to short, we have a you know we have a program helping people on that. But if you don't want that part, just buy the gold. 
uh, and that is a trade in system failure. Buy gold short bonds. Absolutely. That sort of is in sync with what uh, Simon Hunt and Alistair McLeod have been saying on the channel here as well. 10% bond yields is is a possibility based on what we just discussed, maybe debt implosions as well. Um, I want to tr cross the threshold into 2024 a little bit and use the Magnificent Seven, maybe the S&P 500, sort of as that, uh, how you call it, the, the gateway maybe to open the door for 2024, because I'm looking at the chart of the S&P 500 right now. Uh, it's it's rallied tremendously from t uh, October 27th on. It looks like a massive melt-up because it's a straight-up line pretty much uh, since, since then. And I'm curious to see to hear your thoughts on, uh, c can it proceed? Because the market seems to like the moderate inflation scenario, cheap money, and there seems to be solid growth if you want to believe the GDP numbers uh, that came out of the U.S. as well. So all, all, all that packed together indicates a stronger market. Do you, do you see that continuing in 2024 or do you see that eventually coming to a halt? So the difficult thing about the hyperstagflation framing is on equities, you have two forces working and they are counter each other. And at certain times, one will win out over the other. It's kind of like two wrestlers or two bulls having a bullfight. Um, so the inflationary element and the loss of value in bonds is a turbo juice for all other asset classes, more specifically ones that protect capital, ergo gold, which is capital preservation, not yield, um, because we've had a search for yield 40 year uh, cycle. Now, actually, you should uh, seek for return of capital, not return on capital. And that's why gold is getting the preservation bid. You should play great defense. This is the time for D before was the time for attack by the damn dips uh, in asset classes. So we have had a hyper evaluation as a result of the financialization of everything, which again is the debt. Everything comes back to debt, money being borrowed into existence. So if you get a collapse in the debt markets, you're actually getting death of money because things have to get paid off. The overall liquidity gets sucked out. So people that are indebted uh, that can pay things off, that's money dying. They don't have that money anymore. And the bank doesn't have that loan anymore as an asset. It dies. So borrowing money into existence creates excess liquidity. A disinflationary event creates a collapse. That's not a good environment for valuations on equity, especially if people then suddenly can't meet their, their rent checks. So I don't, uh, I'm not super, you could get some nasty sell-offs that will go with a demand destroying event. That said, the market is up, as you pointed out. We called a head and shoulder that performed to target and you've yet to make that high, but you're getting super close. It was around 480 and you're at about 476 at the moment. But I think we're gonna start the year with a bit more of that, woohoo, the interest rates are going back down and maybe we'll get seven cuts and all of this. I refer you again back to who's gonna buy all the debt for those seven cuts because that rates have to go down the elbow has to go back up i don't want to build a bond portfolio i don't know pensions that uh, are feeling that comfortable about holding debt so maybe the fed will have to monetize it i don't know i don't think you get to have that seven or even maybe that three interest rate cuts and what comes next is the spike the spike absolutely will appear to come out of nowhere and will crush asset valuations on most things uh, certainly on uh, uh, equities. And the problem is you're climbing a wall of worry, and that's often people see it as a bullish thing, um, but it's a dangerous game in a likely reset year, 2024. Why do I say it's a re reset year? Well, apart from the anecdote of the UBI uh, peak chatter over Christmas period, which is quite a high social media period for people, I would also say you have the Bitcoin halvening cycle. Bitcoin has gone up. Every uh, even year, uh, not of the four year even year, so 24, I would expect it went up on 20, it went up on 16 into the 17 high, it went up uh, 12 into 13. So the Bitcoin halvening cycle, which is amazingly, uh, coincidentally, also doves tails with a quantitative easing cycle that we've typically had, either of rates reductions and or money creation. So you've got to ask, in 2020, what happened? Well, we all know what happened in 2020, how much uh, the Fed committed in new dollars. 
actually there was a massive bank bailout of about 25 trillion and about 1 trillion got given to citizens. So again, you were getting the poor end of the bargain. Um, European banks got between three and 4 trillion, Credit Suisse, a number of them, US banks, JP Morgan, all got mega liquidity bailouts for real repo issues in October of 2019. But I don't want to get too into those weeds. So the, 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 everything I am saying uh, here is, these, this particular year is quite likely or quite high probability because you also have the election cycle. It's great to say, hey, look, I ran a good four years. Things went a bit ragged in the end, but you know that's not on me. And then the new guy gets to say, well, it was the previous guy and I'm having to clean up his mess. So you kind of think of George Bush uh, W, uh, the second one, he had the subprime crisis and 9-11 uh, and then a Obama was his sweeper and cleaner after that. He had a two cycle and then he handed over and you had crisis again uh, coming in with Trump uh, with the March 2020 events. So the crisis cycle, the QE cycle and uh, the election cycle and then add in the Bitcoin halving cycles all are on the same four year cycle. Now, I just don't like those amount of coincidences, but all I can say is you're going into that and there's a whole bunch of UBI chatter going on right now and Canada's talking about 2000 USD and we have great you know, data to prove that it's great for your mental health not to have anxiety about money. Well, if that's your reasoning for communism and Bolshevik uh, printing of fiat money, that's absolute destruction because that all goes on debt because there's no point if you tax it all back out of the same people, they're not getting it. Um, so it all goes on debt, which is a currency guaranteed destroyer. So we're going to see currency proliferations. And the debt crisis that I keep referring back to is going to damage banks, which are the intermediaries. So they will be failure there. But it also affects currencies because you get the relative assessment. Thank you, by the way, for paying uh, kudos to us for the Japanese yen call. The yen has gone down 30%. Why? Because in rate terms, it kept its rates a lot lower than everybody else. British, when they didn't match the American increase, we got the British pension crisis. Uh, people didn't want to buy their debt. They were selling their de the British debt, selling the pound for dollars and buying the US debt and getting a higher yield. So the global money can wash all around. These are the forces and it's these little uh, aspects that have me believing you don't want to be losing your head on asset valuation in a likely environment where you're going to get a contractionary period before you get the proliferation. The cure, once the cure is announced, it's going to be the same as it always is. Sure, get long then, get long gold, get long Bitcoin, have a flutter on the spy on calls. But you don't want to be the bag holder in the, the, the setup, which is the crash before that. Absolutely. Like, one thought popped into my mind, like we're seeing a bit of a mega trend happening in AI right now. Uh, actually I actually had a conversation over lunch with a friend today as well, and uh, he, he's close to a company that's developed an AI to help mail sorting and things like that. And uh, they, they tested it at one of the German large industrial companies, and apparently they had 25 people in the mailroom before, after they inserted uh, or installed the AI locally, 20 of them were let go. Okay, so talking and about- And what do you think that does for employment, by the way? And the need for UBI suddenly. That's a, that's sort of the that's where my mind yeah. went. Uh, you actually need UBI, otherwise you'll probably fall into chaos. Because at some point there's going to be that inflection point where you sort of create chaos on the streets because people are just desperate, right? Yeah. So a AI is going to be the new dot com, as it was in ninety nine two thousand, if you can recall it. So anything that associates AI to the name is likely to get a ridiculously high valuation well ahead of its actual development. Um, a bit like cannabis stocks a while ago, you know, you get to be on trend and woo, -woo but often the business is lagging that. Um, there'll be a lot of good businesses, but I'd also highlight that it's status and it's part of the Magnificent Seven portfolios. They're going to be some of the biggest beneficiaries. They have the biggest resources, they have the biggest data centers, they have the biggest computing power, and uh, the odd innovative SME could probably do some pretty useful things. Uh, and then hopefully get bought out by uh, Schmoogle or, you know, Alphabet or any of them. But uh, generally, I would expect the status Magnificent Seven to be scooping up anything innovative that comes in AI. And it is, again, a citizen management tool. You're getting to this point where um, entrepreneurship, capital, 
and then a business plan where what you needed for capitalism. What are you going to do as the entrepreneur? And labor was part of that. Um, so you had capital and labor. Now, if you now need significantly less labor and you're going to do A, robotics, which is doing the physical things humans did. And, you know, I was sitting there watching a Husqvarna lawnmower mow the lawn and you've got these mobile vacuums. Cleaners are getting unemployed. It's a lot of the more mundane things, but it's getting into a lot more of the uh, the, the well thought uh, algorithmic things. You mentioned yourself an example. So what we tend to do is we're going to lose. We don't need the amount of labor anymore and that's uh, that's a concern so hence the ubi and also hence possible other things as to, a little bit more dark as to what happens to the excess labor do, do you see uh what would you call it like job creation in other sectors as well because there are a lot of government incentive programs as well to sort of boost the ev revolution the green technologies uh is that something that could de- keep the economy afloat at least for a little while longer uh, maybe even longer than we expected <laughs> So I don't see anything that government does as a recruiting tool as uh, economically stimulative. I see it as a drag. Inherently, there's the tax pay- other taxpayers that are doing private business have to fund those new jobs. So all that does uh, accelerates debt accumulation, which is uh, kind of the great way to crescendo into collapse and to finish destroying what was actually a, a very robust dynamic uh capitalist nation uh in america and actually the world to a large degree uh so we are in the process of destroying free market price discovery capitalism where state and injecting statism as the employer of last resort the salary player via ubi of last resort the decision maker of all things of last resort uh they have higher power over parents on children as last resorts and what gets taught in schools we are essentially seeing ultimate centralization um and a technocratic communism coming for the citizenry through the access of quasi-government, transnational government, and mega corporations that are status-funded and living off the hog of debt-raised income. So the government raises huge amounts of debt and dishes out uh, corporate contracts to the mega corps that are cleared to do it, and they all push the woke agenda. So this is a very, very dangerous captured system that uh, leaves... And again, I highlight complete polarization. One of our most popular videos was done on Greenwich Hill in the UK, talking in 2017 of a global polarization. You will either be smart, build wealth, and become part of a wealthy elite, whether you want to bond and connect with the the rest of the billionaires from Microsoft, or you're going to be pushed down into a mega serfdom class and that is the perfect setup for uh that communistic type uh structure that i've been suggesting is coming for us so i really encourage people make sure you're a rich slave it's far better you have more privileges uh and you have more rights and you'll live in a better hood and you'll be able to buy some freedom of movement and various other things because i see a very aggressive totalitarian global system that's pretty synchronized coming out that said i don't want to black pull and doom and gloom everybody there's a beautiful nature there's a beautiful world to be lived ride in nature go and breathe air swim i've just had cold water submersion done a lot of awesome things spending time with family life is great uh you have to find a way to stay local of mindset and resistance to uh, a totalitarian macro psyop of gaslighting. Um, you're going to be hearing how awesome UBI is and all of that, but nobody ever gets a straight answer as where the money comes from. Absolutely. For instance, it would be a perfect note to end our conversation on, but I have one more topic I want to tackle, and it's commodities yeah. in general. Because uh, A, we haven't talked about silver, gold's little brother. And uh, we haven't talked about, you know, base metals in particular as well and what your outlook there is. Uh, but let's start off with uh, with silver. What are your expectations for silver in the coming, you know, 12 months? Uh, is it going to move just like gold hand in hand? Is it going to, you know, break out or what, what, what's your forecast? So longer run silver outperforms while you're still in the early stages, gold outperforms. Um, However, the gold-silver ratio, in our opinion, which is in the mid-80s, I'm just going to check a chart. I'm looking down while I uh, speak to you because I want to get the update because there's actually quite a big move on gold, which is not being reciprocated on silver right now. So again, gold's still the leader generally in the the move. And that will point to institutions, hedge funds, um, central banks. 
Those are the deep pockets. They haven't, they don't want storage with mega warehouses and costs. You can get a lot of value in gold in a smaller pace. Um, so the big money chases gold, but the people's money is silver, as many people like to say. So gold is dominating at the, at the moment. Um, but when gold starts to go near parabolic, I would expect uh, silver to just overtake and just ignite. And silver is quite some way behind um, but when it runs, it runs exceptionally. So again, you need a bit of extra patience for silver, but you're already starting to get exactly what you need in gold. You're getting the new highs in gold, and it's only time, in my opinion, before silver follows up to that $40, $45, $50 range. That's a key zone for us. At that point, I would expect a reasonable pullback potentially, but if, if the proliferation is at full speed ahead, um, we'll, we'll blast through that in good order. And longer run, I'm seeing a, a 30s uh, gold-silver ratio and eventually a single digit. So it's part and parcel. And that can be, I want to make this important point as well as part of your question, that can be coinciding with that interest rate spike that I am mentioning. So I want to point out, the eventual capitulation of rates in the March of 2020, when everyone was in bonds, everyone, and the and bonds were super valuable and the rates capitulated to 0.3% uh, on the 10 year in this in America. That was the super spike on the gold silver ratio of 128. So these two are the yin and yang. When the one goes dark, the other one goes light. They are coincident in uh, the major events. So when people are peak bullish bonds, they're not holding gold and silver. When they're prepared to take 0.3% yield a year for an investment, they're not thinking gold and silver. When they no longer have any confidence in bonds, they're absolutely thinking capital preservation and they're only thinking about gold and silver. So the two events coincided, the blow off in the gold silver ratio to 128 and the capitulation in yields, which was a super final end, a bookmarking end to the bond bull market. And it was a bookmarking blow off end to the bond to the gold silver ratio and with lower gold silver ratio you can only expect higher gold and even higher silver so you're gonna to have to wait a bit more for the silver but you get in your gold rewards already and the silver comes <laughs> this time and it's the miners be after that <laughs> sorry yeah, we'll, we'll talk about the miners in a second as well but a, a, a phrase i heard a lot over the last 12 months is like this time is going to be different and one thing popped in my mind while you were talking about silver is like how much is silver an industrial metal versus a precious metal you're obviously looking at the charts so emotion doesn't really factor in there but if you look at the users and if you believe in a global economic collapse and maybe a bit of a reset and uh, economic reset in 2024 or even 2025 for that matter like how does silver or the lack of silver, the silver price right now, fit into into that narrative? Because could there be a decoupling where where gold is the only safe haven investment? And uh, probably going to get a lot of hate for that in the comments below. But uh, is silver still that precious metal? Is it does it still have the same role? Yeah. You hinted at it before, but. Uh, just curious. Well, when people start wilting and asking questions like that, you know you can't be too far away in that sense. It's a sensible thing to ask, by the way. I'm not having a go by making that. But it's, it tells you that, you know, um, patience has run thin. You're at the end. You've got to remember, just go look at uranium. What uranium's done recently, and everybody, it was the most loathed. People got so sick and tired of it. It was two decades, three decades of nothingness, you know, literally from Ronald Reagan's uh, and, Put and it wasn't Putin at the time, it was Yeltsin uh, agreement on disarmament, which saw a lot of uranium drop on the market. It had this huge shelf overhang. And then you had Fukushima, which was, you know, the, everybody said, no, it's because of nuclear. We're not doing it. Germany canceled. France were canceling. I mean, you couldn't have had more negative uh, you. Uh, you know, uh, overhang news for uh, a topic and go look at what it's done subsequently, uranium. The same goes for iron ore. Go look at rhodium, uh, what's held uh, shot, and you saw how platinum, palladium shot. So palladium and rhodium are in the platinum group of metals, and you saw how high they went. They are very thinly provided metals. So, you know, if you don't have them, you have to pay if you really want them. Um, so, uh, and they've been uh, markets that were quiet. You know, palladium used to cost $197. It ran right up to $4,300. Um, so uh, everything gets its day. You've got to remember when you talk about commodities, 
commoditization is essentially when there's not much difference. Everything is reduced to a uniform package and is very similar so that you could have something like a futures contract, X amount of lumber, X length of wood, et cetera. Everything is almost to the point of standardization and the super normal profits in creating it are gone. So they become businesses that are very scale, thin margins, and uh, uh, widely consumed. Well, when they get crushed, like uh, e, the, the BlackRock's ESG requirements, what and you start to get no new investments, overhangs getting cleared, uh, and very low margins that lot go bust. A lot of bust uh, commodity producers in March 2020, um, you know, think of offshore oil rigs after the crash. You end up um, in a, an imperfect setup for a very strong move. Um, but most people don't have, again, the patience to sit out uh, that. The setup takes a while. We watch the charts. We do other things in the meantime. We don't want to sit in something unnecessarily long going sideways or even down a little more. Um, so that's why we watch the charts. Uh, but they, they do come and they return with a bang. And then suddenly everybody knows. Iron ore had a massive run. You have, you've had sugar make runs. You've had um, uh, live cattle make massive runs. These are all ag agries, farmer agries, uh, softs that have all started falling out of bed. This is going to be very positive. We've got a very good setup on the Bavespa, which is the index in Brazil. So this is a soft and agri's uh, producer of great scale. Equities, they have terribly low valuations and have been around for a long, long time. As you know, as crazy as the politics are, where's the rule of law in America nowadays? Do they deserve that premium that they get in the American markets? Now you've got a major market here that is producing softs that everybody needs, that grows great soil. So you're going to see a reallocation and a rethinking, apart from the likes of AI and the magnificent seven of status, which are actually global tools being used against all of us rather than American. Um, and that's why I, I see them transcending into the super elite of mega corporates that are very much extensions of government, even though officially they're private companies. Absolutely. Um, copper is the last topic I want to touch on because it seems like copper is put in a bottom and uh, as a bit of an economic indicator, I'm a uh, I wouldn't say I'm confused, but I'm trying to figure out what this what signal copper is sending me here. Is it telling me that China is doing better than everybody expects, or is it telling me that uh, there might not be an economic crash next year? Um, what what is copper telling you, and uh, should be telling us? I haven't checked the copper price in a few moments, so I'm just quickly uh, scanning it. Copper. Let me get the word in. I had typed <laughs> high grade, high grade copper. Uh, Three ninety four a pound. It's coming from 350 only uh, mid October. There's the futures. Let's go to the futures, grab that and high grade and see what I got for you. Just like that copper topic because it really sort of puts the uh, you know eco economic discussion it's puts a bow around that. it. Yeah, poor man's gold, hundred uh, percent. Uh, I I like how it's set up. I like how it's set up. Looking at it here, uh, and it's one to keep an eye on for an upside uh, move. And uh, the Chinese are Dr. Copper. You know, they remember Dr. Copper was a trader in China. Um, and I think it is an important metal for construction um, and building and wiring. It gets used in a lot of things. The, the battery environment is going to be very heavy on copper, going to be heavy on cobalt, going to be heavy on lithium, going to actually have some additional silver requirements following your previous request. So we've got quite a few uh, aspects that as long as we're pursuing the battery um, game, uh, there's going to be ev ever more upside requirements there. I just don't feel that the everyday retail consumer is going to be that strong. You're going to get to point to peak Tesla, you know, who's going to be buying the Tesla once all the upper middle class um, virtue signalers have got a Tesla. That doesn't mean it's wrong to have a Tesla, but it, it's not as green as it is portrayed. But they're also expensive. How many do you have to make before you actually get, you know, down to an everyday guy who's buying a second hand truck now buys uh, a new Tesla? Well, you're going to I don't think they've got that uh, level of profitability in them. And at current commodity prices. I don't think the consumer is that strong that you're going to get into those lower echelons and they're all going to be Tesla guys. And I also think the commodity costs are too high. And I also think they're undersupplied that if you started to try and do that, you would cause a squeeze on global uh, prices. So I see a good future for uh, copper technically. Inherently, all these commodities are actually flagging 
re by relative degrees, devaluation of pricing, the money, the money it's priced in. So all will move up by a minimum certain amount. And those that are at the lowest ebb are probably getting some degree of economies of scale or efficiency that are seeing them go up less than the others. And some that will go up super fast um, may not only be flagging the money devaluation, but extra normal demand for a specific line of items. So you know, again, um, if you can position around AI, if you can position around battery, uh, here where I am, for example, the status supplier, ESCOM, for electricity fails to provide electricity, including for mines. They all need to get uh, uh, power independence. They have safety power to get people out the ground when the power is cut off, but they don't have functioning power to maintain act, uh, their actual activities of production. So once they've got everybody up, they shut the mine down until the status provider can actually provide electricity again. So they are going to have to go battery up inverters, uh, solar panels. And this is a massive demand uh, curve for all these uh, aspects. Solar is huge on silver. Silver is the best conductor. Um, it, it's got, everyone now has solar panels. It's now a theft item, you know, uh, and, and being non-reliant on state is one of the best things. So I actually see this a negative that's an inherent positive enforcer because it encourages people to do something that makes them non-reliant on state provision. Uh, and my, my my tip to everybody watching this is develop your own self-reliance. It is a financial preparative message, but develop your own self-reliance for energy, clean water, uh, security, and everything else, and be in communities of others of like-minded so that they're not stabbing you in the back if we get a bit of zombie apocalypse time. <laughs> um, and this all spells very well for the likes of copper and silver. However, they may become too expensive for the layman. So having solar panels might be very much a sort of middle, middle upper class thing um, if the if the commodities move too far. Absolutely. Fantastic. F Francis, fantastic commentary. Let's uh, get gun to your head. What's going to be the most uh, influential event next year? Uh, I'm going to take a wild card ha uh, uh, hack on uh, global banking systems that sees balances uh, zero yeah. as my out there because they've told us in or implied that. And it's a great platform to introduce UBI. It's a great uh, event to actually reset the debt markets and say, who could have thunk it? They went and done that to us. Let's declare war, start some war, do some citizen elimination and uh, bank accounts in certain areas are down or possibly very largely. Uh, and I think self-reliance, have your gold on you, not in a um, uh, safety deposit box, have your wealth close to you. Possession being nine tenths of the law will serve you exceedingly well during this time. They are pushing us into a digitized society. They will control what happens digitally. If we're all in Tesla cars, we can be remotely controlled and driven to the police station or straight into the basement prison uh, <laughs> for hate crimes or wrong think. So what you want to do is you want to be out of the digital system as much as possible whilst maintaining one finger in it so that you can just do your practical needs because unfortunately technology is technology and we can't stop the tide. But there is a nasty surveillance finance and a globalist type agenda that wants to be avoided. So be physical um, and make sure the bulk of your wealth is there. There's a transition that has to happen and you need to have it with you during this period, not with counterparty risk, including shares. Look at the great taking. Look at many of these things. You don't own what you think you own. You don't own the money in the bank. They own it. They owe you. It's an IOU that they have. Get Get with your wealth, get it around you and get secure so that you can carry it over into the new system rather than be robbed out and made ward of state and then needing to comply with all status agendas uh, that could have. So I, I fear that 2024 is the year, that cycle that I referred to um, could be tricky and that'll, that'll, that'll have far reaching implications for many people. Fantastic. Francis, thank you so much for your time. Really, really insightful conversation. Definitely looking forward to catching up with you in the new year. Uh, let's see around Easter. It should be a good time to see where we're at and uh, get a bit of a watermark uh, in, in terms of uh, you know trends that have been uh, sort of happening in 2024. Where can we find more of you, Francis? Uh, how can we find more of your work? Yeah. So, I mean, 
Go and have a look at our YouTube, uh, The Market Sniper. See if you like what we're doing. So, you know, we called the collapse in the yen and uh, a lot of equities are to the long side, actually, that are yen hedges. We've got a lot of macro trades that we're doing. We actually think crypto could do well, but that's not to say we are all believers in there. Selective, that's a bit risky. Higher beta for those that can stomach that. We're strong on the metals and the commodities in this environment. We are a bit more cautious on the energies. Go and see the cut of our jib. We get to call the market on the basis of the footprints in the sand they can't help but show you what they do through what they uh, activate in their buy and sell orders in the market that's the closest and best way i know to get to the truth of what the world's biggest money is actually doing and it's in the charts it shows you what is being bought what is being sold patterns really work we do pattern analysis technical analysis and we're actually the forensic detectives of financial markets and that's how we got to be short oil without knowing about the March 2020 uh, pandemic. We short a liner and cruise company and a pipeline, oil pipeline company as well, even though you would think reductions in oil price would be good for a cruise liner. Uh, and then we got the result later as to why. Um, and same with the Euro Swiss franc and many other macro technical calls. Get these things accurate. And it's not day trading. It's not sitting with nine screens. And our YouTube channel is the best introduction for that. And we also have the crypto sniper if you're interested in that crypto element. So the market and the crypto sniper for uh, updates. And then if you like that, come and book a, uh, a call, have a chat, or even just attend one of our live trading days to get a little bit closer, which is a low cost uh, trial for you. Fantastic. Francis, really, really appreciate your time. As I said before, I know it's busy with family time, friend time between Christmas and New Year's. I know you're not at home right now as well, so you are traveling. So tremendously appreciate it. Thank you so much. All the best in 2024, Francis. Happy New Year. And as we're airing this on New Year's Eve, Happy New Year to everybody else. Thank you so much for tuning in. I hope 2023 was somewhat prosperous for you. Uh, we're trying to provide a lot of information so that 2024 can be prosperous as well. You just heard it from Francis as well. Gold is the response. This is going to be the YouTube title as well. I wrote it down. I kind of like that. Uh, sounds fantastic. But but keep that in mind. Put put you know watch, watch a lot of content. There's a lot of great interviews. A lot of great content out there. I hope our information makes sense. It helps you build a bit of a gut feeling of what is going on out there. And I hope you continue to follow us in 2024. If you haven't done so, hit that, 20, uh, hit that subscribe button and uh, leave a comment, leave a like. I, we tremendously appreciate it so we can bring guests like Francis back on the channel more frequently. Highly appreciate it. Happy New Year, everybody. Good luck to all. We'll be back next year.